Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's so wonderful to meet up with you again this Sunday morning. And I'm greeting you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, this morning's message touches on the Antichrist. I pray that as we work through this message, the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah, Saviour, will become ever more real to us than ever before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 John 2, verses 18 to 23, and I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Starting at verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. This far as our scripture reading, and we're going to be standing still on verse 18. I'll read it to you again. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. I need to say this and perhaps repeat it again, right at the beginning of this message, that as God's children, we are not waiting for the Antichrist. We are waiting for Jesus. As God's children, we are not waiting for the Antichrist. We are waiting for Jesus. And this realization changes much, or should change much, of the way the world is thinking about end-time events. Now, although there is tremendous curiosity over these end-time events that are all pointing to the imminence of the second coming of Jesus, John, who wrote 1 John somewhere between 85 and 95 AD, in other words, soon after the death of Christ, soon after his ascension, compared to the 2,000 years later where we find ourselves now, back then he reminds us that we are already in the last hour or last time, as some translations put it. Now, saying, you know, the whole idea of the last hour, last time, about 2,000 years ago, is quite interesting. Some people say that it refers to the end of the apostolic age that died out with John. Uh, some saying it's speaking about a dispensation of grace and mercy in which we currently live. And yet others are speaking of a difficult, dangerous and miserable time. But here's what stands out for me. The fact that the affairs of this world are being wound up, things are coming to an end, it's not getting better, it's getting worse, means that the return of Jesus is imminent. And therefore my focus is on Jesus. In verse 18, it's quite interesting there. John on the one hand say, is saying that many antichrists have already come considering that he wrote this in 85 to 95 AD. But on the other hand, he's telling us that the, meaning the final and ultimate Antichrist, is still to come. So the questions we have to work with this morning is, how do we identify this particular Antichrist that is to come? Is he already alive? Must he still be born? Is he in power already? Which country is he going to come from? Big questions indeed. 
But let's approach it from the word of Antichrist, specifically the anti in Antichrist. This anti has two meanings. It means, firstly, instead of or to substitute. And secondly, the obvious meaning, against. Some of you will remember that on the 9th of August this year, a Sunday message was about false teachers. And one of the characteristics of a false teacher was the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ or simply teaching a different Jesus. And on this note, we would do well to take note of the Greek word for Antichrist, meaning Antichristos, because that is literally translated to being an opponent of Christ. So, coming from this morning's scripture reading, John in verse 22 actually tells us who the Antichrist is. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. And John continues in verse 23. If you deny Jesus, you deny the Father. Simply put, Jesus and the Father are one. So, the Antichrist is rejecting this unity. He's denying that Jesus is the Christ, fully God and at one with the Father. The Antichrist is the ultimate representation of what it means to go against Christ. And it will instead claim to be Christ, even having supernatural power and global influence. Further on in 1 John, specifically chapter 4 verse 2, we read, by this you know the Spirit of God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is already in the world. God the Father, God the, Sp the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. There is a unity between these three who are one. Deny Jesus, you deny the Father. And you can only really confess Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a close, close unity between the three. Let's move to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. It's a very well-known piece of scripture. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaim, proclaiming himself to be God. Brothers and sisters, the Antichrist is going to chase after world domination and try to destroy the followers of Jesus. Sadly, and I think you can relate to this, part of this process is going to cause people to either abandon faith or to corrupt solid Christian doctrine, to twist the word and twist the pathway of salvation. There's going to be a total onslaught of false teachings. So I need to ask you, do you see any of this in the world yet? Let me briefly explain, and explain it from Revelation chapter 13. Verses 1 to 10 describe a beast from the sea with seven heads and ten horns on its head. There are blasphemous names there as well. Now the dragon gives this beast its power. And I notice that the beast has a healed mortal wound, something that should have killed it. And this beast sets itself in opposition to Christ. Now if we move on to verses 11 to 17, the second beast is the false prophet. It has two horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. So from this, we get a religious role, where the first one, you know, it's leaning towards a political role. But here's what we need to know. The false prophet will appear to be Christ, but speak like Satan. The second beast is going to support the first beast, claiming power from the first beast and 
Satan. The second beast is going to cause the inhabitants of earth to worship the first beast. And therefore, the third piece, the third part of the unholy trinity falls into place. Satan, an antichrist, and a false prophet. Now, some scholars, you know, they, they think that the Antichrist is going to come from a confederation of ten nations or a re reborn Roman Empire, or maybe even a Jew, so that he can claim to be the Messiah. But the truth be told, the Bible does not specifically state the eth ethnicity or nationality of the Antichrist. Now, there's much speculation about who the Antichrist is. And living in 2020, some common suggestions are Vladimir Putin, the Pope, Prince William, or even Donald Trump. But I emphasize that these are the speculations of our time, 2020. In reality, though, many other candidates have been identified over the course of history. Um, Luther, for example, thought that the Pope was the Antichrist pretty much like some people today. In 1940s, uh, Hitler came up as a possible candidate of being the Antichrist. But the fact is we don't know with any certainty who the Antichrist is. Perhaps he has been born, perhaps he must still be born. But this is what we need to say to each other. There will be no doubt about the identity of the Antichrist when he appears. But we do know that the spirit of the Antichrist is already in this world. And there we turn into 1 John 4 verse 3. And so once held solid orthodox Christian doctrine is already being opposed. And has been opposed over the years of course. But where we stand here today in 2020, we see that post-modernism and post-foundationalism, big words, absolute reality are calling into question truth and reality. In other words, there's a movement away from the absolute truth to a relative truth. What is true for you doesn't have to be true for me. What is real for you doesn't have to be real for me. But in biblical doctrine, and biblical teaching, truth is reality and reality is truth. How else can you approach the Father in spirit and in truth? This has been gnawed away at. Then we have something called social constructivism. And social constructivism is making decisions of the validity of portions of Scripture and how the Scriptures should be determined. In other words, we're in a position where Scripture is not necessarily speaking on its own behalf, but men are interpreting Scripture to suit their own ends, and therefore men are speaking on behalf of Scripture instead of Scripture speaking on behalf of Scripture. Very disturbing thought that. The deity of Jesus Christ has been called into question. This is open, it's right out there. You don't have to search very far for it. Even things such as the virgin birth has been called into question. And of course, there is much, much more. The, the time of this message doesn't allow me to touch on everything. But I need to, in closing, once again state that as Christians, we are not waiting for the Antichrist. We are waiting for Christ. And although the Antichrist, together with many other signs, will go ahead of Jesus' return, and I mean these signs are already happening, look around you, read the newspapers, we still always look towards Jesus. And through the lens of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Son of God and our Savior, we interpret the world around us. It's Christ first, Christ foremost. It's all about Jesus, not the Antichrist. We, as John clearly states, know the truth because we know and belong to Jesus. And our salvation is sealed by the Holy Spirit who guides us into all truth. And there you can go read John 16 verse 13. I think that ours is to rather constructively grow in him than to commit valuable time to speculation. Rather know the truth, rather know Jesus, rather know that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Son of God, 
grow in him, to him. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you into this truth. Rather do that than speculate about everything that is happening around us. And when you do see the things that are happening around us, then evaluate them in the light of Jesus and the truth of Scripture. We don't know the date and time of Jesus' return, but we do know that He is coming, and our work here on earth is not done. We know that He is coming. We don't know when He's coming. The question that we need to ask each other is, are you ready for His coming? Therefore, brothers and sisters, I must encourage you, in the power of the Holy Spirit, continue to make disciples. Be a faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain vigilant. Let's remain faithful so that we do not become deceived. Go and help others to find Jesus. Hold on. He is coming again. Amen. Heavenly Father, it is so comforting to know that you are coming again and that we can hold on to that truth. Even briefly this morning, I mean, we didn't even really break surface about the Antichrist and the things that are going to still happen in this world. We didn't break that. You know, we, we didn't even get into any detail there. But we choose to hold on to the fact that you are coming and that what's happening around us, Antichrist, false prophets, all of these things, the catastrophes the Bible speak of, should actually encourage us as time draws closer because that means you're coming to get us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for being our Savior. Thank you that we can, in the power of the Holy Spirit, live our lives to the glory of God the Father. Lord Jesus, as we discuss these things, we say, Come Lord Jesus, come soon. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'll see you next Sunday morning. Until then, look for Jesus. Hold on to him. Await his second coming. Live each and every moment of each and every day to his glory. God be with you. Amen. Please remember to find us on Facebook, like this video, and subscribe to this channel. See you next week. Bye-bye.